they will start from yes they will uh, they will communicate it from this
local. Hello. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good evening everybody. First of all, uh, let me to introduce our panel. Uh, Dr. Asif Islam sitting on right side me, Dr. Shafiq Rahman and Dr. MD Shafiullah. We are uh, from King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals uh, and, uh, Renewable Energy Research Center, Renewable and Power Center. So we are here to present Now it's for. Okay. Uh, we are here to present the Exploring the Renewable Energy Technology Resources, Environmental Impact Policy and Regulatory Framework and Challenges for the Smart Energy System Integration. So our presentation, our discussion is uh, basically divided in three parts. The first part uh, will be covered by Dr. Shafiq Rahman. He will be exploring the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia Renewable Energy Resources. And the second part will be uh, grid integration challenges in, of the renewable energy technologies in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the third part, I will uh, discuss the environmental impact and the policies and the regulation of uh, renewable energy technologies. So I would like to request Dr. Shafiq Rahman uh, to start it. Thank you. Yes, uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with MINA Environmental Week. And I really thank to all the organizers of such a humongous event which they have organized. And uh, as uh, Dr. Amjad introduced, we are from King Fahad University of Petroleum and Midnas Dharan. And we drove all the way this morning and made to this hall, uh, which may be a little bit tiring for us. And also, I think for the audience, they have also spent the whole day. So it may be they might be finding tiring for them. But inshallah, we'll try to cover it uh, within the time frame we're given to us. Uh, renewable resources, when we say, like, you know, anything related to environment, it is backed by the meteorology, you know. And for any sort of renewable investment, correct, accurate assessment is the key for the success of that particular uh, investment. It may be solar, it may be wind, geothermal, biomass, or you name it. So, the base is the, of all the renewables, the base, the starting point is the meteorology, you know. When we say the meteorology, so you have to understand the variability of the wind and the direction while you are talking about the wind resources or wind power development. On the other hand, if you are talking of about solar energy, solar photovoltaic, solar thermal, or whatever. So the meteorology comes into play again. And so solar radiation intensity, its variability, you know, becomes ultimate, ultimately important to, for a successful investment in solar energy, whether it's PV or uh, similarly, other sources you can say. In Saudi Arabia, we have, you know, wind and solar energy. Solar energy is abandoned in this part of the world. And also, as per our assessment of the institute at King Fahad University, uh, wind power also does do exist in uh, different parts of the kingdom. Having said that, 
I'll just go, why do we need renewables, okay? Just spend two or three, two minutes, and then shed light on global and local uh, renewable energy scenarios. Uh, when we say global and then local means our, you know, Middle East and, and regional and then Saudi Arabia in particular. And then some of the initiatives at King Fahad University of Fertolium, we have been through all last, like I am associated with this last more than 30 years. So uh, why do we need these renewables? You know, today's scenario, we have some natural disasters, okay? Uh, that is because of the meteorological combinations which come through pressure, temperature, relative humidity, all these combinations make the things, though they are running, they are operating this all the way normal, but all of a sudden it happens. And it is basically due to the human interference into the uh, natural environmental system. And what is the results? If we see the falling buildings, freeze, freezing to death, like we have seen, you know, in US last year also, in the, what happened during the winter, uh, Buffalo and those regions. And then we have, you know, uh, uh, water, any, uh, this thing, you know, and then heat strokes and all those things. And then, we come up with a, you know, a measurement, how to measure, then we, you know, measure it in terms of life we lost, and the economic losses are, you know, term, major in terms of rebuilding, how we will re rebuild these uh, uh, lost, uh, our uh, 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 properties and the, so these are some of the examples you can see. You have seen this. I'm just, it's a reminder. I'm not, giving, I'm not giving you any new information with this slide. But the only thing is, I'm trying to remind myself and the audience that what causes, you know, my, a, my individual, you know, cutting of a tree may not affect directly, but the cutting of thousands of millions of trees by millions of people cutting only one tree, you have a cumulative effect. It's a local effect altogether, then it becomes a regional and a global. And that's why we see these type of uh, <coughs> effects, you know. Like Japan tsunami we have seen in 2011. What happened? You know, 16 towns and so many buildings and around more than 25,000 lives we lost, no matter which part of the world, but it was the part of the, of the globe. Similarly, Myanmar and also Mexico earthquake in 2018 and forest fires also we see. So these are the after effects, after mass of uh, the natural events, met meteorological events happening uh, globally. Uh, these are, you know, s uh, slides showing you how many unique events happen due to geophysical events, unique events happen due to geophysical events, and the met meteorological event which I was talking about, hydrological events, and climatological. Uh, you can see it's on the increase almost, you know, from year to year. Uh, it's a bit old data up to 2016, uh, so maybe more events could have happened during last four or five years. And when you see in terms of how many, you know, in terms of dollars, this Japan's earthquake, you know, tsunami, we had a financial burden of around 235 billion. It's not that it is happening in a certain part of the world, but the today's economy is globalized. We are interconnected. I cannot isolate Saudi Arabia's you know, economy. What happens in Japan is not going to affect me. 
it will okay and it did so as uh, like i said you know when i cut a tree it has an impact an effect so i have to realize that hurricane katrina so around 100 to 150 billion dollars and then hurricane irma in 2017 200 billion so i mean these are the big numbers you know big numbers are there uh, which directly or indirectly affect me you and everybody else so as i said global and renewable power scenarios you know uh, i'm specifically talking about the renewables now and particularly wind and the solar i have because these are the two technologies which are commercially available although there are many other geothermal in saudi arabia we have a lot of in harat you know and geysers in Jizan or Alith, all those areas. And do, we do have uh, uh, this thing, you know, Harat uh, in the western region of Saudi Arabia, when you say, like, if you go from Mecca or Jeddah towards Medina, so they are Harat. But still, we have not explored those to the magnitude level, though we know they are there, they exist. And also, uh, this, you know, uh, oh, the, so these are still, you know, for this part of the world, and the hydro are is still far uh, from the reach as of today scenario. So renewables, if you see globally, we have around 3,000 plus gigawatt installed capacity is done by the uh, end of 2022. And in the Middle East, this number goes to around 28 plus gigawatt. And Saudi Arabia, uh, we are, you know, around 0.4 gigawatt. But I have said something in red, you know, 0.415. This is the wind farm at Dhamatal Jandal in uh, Sekaka, or you can say Jaff region, with which is not yet appeared in the IEA books. So I just put this number in red. So you can say around one giga, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, has the contribution towards this. Just to mention one thing more, Saudi Arabia, these numbers may give you an impression that we are low on the side, but I tell you back in uh, early 80s, we, the Saudi Arabia, as the first country who has the first ever uh, PV power plant grid connected in Solar Village in Riyadh, okay? That was the first in the world, world's largest PV plant. So Saudi Arabia has always been in forefront where renewables is concerned. Then when we say the wind in uh, offshore and onshore, we have two parts, okay, uh, globally. So like in wind onshore we have more than 800 gigawatt and offshore is, is still you know on progress is 63 gigawatt middle east uh, we have you know uh, 1.1 gigawatt uh, and out of this the onshore is one and offshore yet we have to enter and also uh, the saudi arabia uh, we have the first wind turbine of 2.75 megawatt in Thrive. That is the site which was identified by our institute sometimes, you know, if you say 20 years back. So there we have the first ever wind turbine from the GE, uh, explored by, uh, been arranged by Saudi Aramco. And then plus I again say this is the red in number, this is the Dhamatal Jindal. Onshore, all is onshore, offshore, yet uh, we have not entered into it. Now we are working on the wind power resourcement in the Red Sea. We did some in Aqaba region and some in uh, Gulf. And <clears throat> so it will take some time when we explore the whole of the Red Sea, how the wind resource is there, is it doable or not, or at what cost. Uh, then, I am not able to see the other uh, numbers, but you know, uh, with respect to uh, solar, 
also we are doing good. And uh, still the, some of the numbers which Saudi Arabia has a lot of investment in solar in many places. So we have uh, uh, to any case, uh, any of, uh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, this is the first wind turbine, which was, as I told you, and I was installed in uh, Saudi Arabia from GE. So renewable sources, they include, as I said, all those things, uh, biomass, hydro, wind, and all. And renewable energy, why it is important, energy security, environmental sustainability. When we say sustainable, means it should be sustainable in all aspects, like economic and social, and all those, and energy diversification, energy accessibility. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, maybe for some of you, maybe a news, we have more than 40 villages as of today not connected to the grid. I have been to some of those villages, and we try to provide a solution for them, penetrating through wind and solar into existing diesel system. And then technological advancements, reduce air pollution, economies, and benefits, all those things are the importance of this. And <coughs> then this renewable energy okay, resources so spent is the abil availability of renewable energy sources varies by region, by you know area, by 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 height, like wind, you know, is a highly fluctuating parameter. It changes with time, with place, with height, okay? So whenever we say the wind speed as is 5.5 meter per second, has no meaning until unless I say 5.5 meter per second at 50 meter above the ground level. So these are the some of the technical points related with this. Uh, I have given some definitions here, but uh, because of the time, shortage, like geothermal energy depends on us, internal heat, which is contained there, and likewise biomass and others. And wind energy, just I'm giving you an example, uh, analysis of historical meteorological data in terms of annual, monthly, diurnal variability of wind speed is really of prime importance. And we have to have, like, to start with what we do, we take the available data from the airports or other stations. Uh, this may be at 10 meter of the ground level, 12 meter or 8 meter or 5 meter. And we start our analysis from there, historical data. And then we po point some, you know, potential locations where we recommend for the measurement of uh, wind at different heights. And then we go on for the actual assessment. And then we do the conduct the, as we did. We have done some measurements uh, deploying the 40 meters to 100 meter tall towers, and we did the measurement at different tires. And then we can say, okay, if we have the uh, possibility of predicting the de uh, data up to half height of the wind turbine accurately. Uh, these are some of the things we did with our own uh, uh, initiative and our own hands. At Rodad bin Hambas, I just told you, just a village near uh, uh, Rafaha in the northeast of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we did uh, install these, uh, selected these equipment, installed and did the measurement and then suggested them the, uh, any, uh, uh, the solution. So these are some of these, you know, uh, figures related to that. Then we do the measurement, just an example of what are the sensors we use at the ground level and at different heights above the ground level. And then hybrid power system, as I said, we suggested for these villages which are not yet connected, hybrid is the excellent solution. And instead of just making the diesel zero, we penetrate through the wind of this 20%, 25%, 30%, at least if we can uh, reduce the reliance on the diesel and all those, and then at the same time, we can decrease uh, the dependence on oil and also decrease the uh, air pollution and the emissions of greenhouse gases in the local atmosphere, and at the same time, we can reduce the 
uh, the, the medical bills also. And this is the case study again the, for the same village we did. Uh, and then we have some hybrid power system at our institute uh, for supplying, you know, uh, the power to the uh, to the to the you know uh, specific application like the lidars, you know, wind profilers you can use, and then for the uh, place you don't have the power wall power, so you can use these uh, reliable hybrid power system. This particular system has wind, and solar, and the battery and the diesel. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the LIDAR which we have at our facility. Uh, this is the celebration of the first wind turbine in uh, Toref. Okay. And I think this, if you can realize the size of this 658 point something meter long blade, you know, and around so more than 50 tons each blade weighing, you know. So this is really coming to Saudi Arabia and it's really, and okay, I'm done, sorry. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Shafiq Rahman. Dr. Shafiq uh, will be presenting the challenges of smart energy system integration to the national grid of Saudi Arabia. And I will request, please manage the time. Okay. Uh, th uh, thank you, Dr. Amjad and Dr. Shafiq Rahman. Uh, Dr. Shafiq Rahman, he spent his entire life to assess the renewable energy resources inside the kingdom. And his presentation was very lively. And according to, uh, compared to his experience, my experience is very little. Based on the you know beard, you can experience it. Okay, so he started uh, maybe before my birth in Saudi Arabia. Anyway, so I will cover the challenges of smart energy systems uh, integration, especially the challenges for renewable energy integration into the grid. Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. Shafiullah. So before uh, going to the topic, I'll give you a little bit background. And I know that my colleague Dr. Shafiq Rahman and Dr. Amjad they have some similar uh, topics. So I'll try to. Uh, reduce the redundancy in the information. So here, what uh, drives us to the, you know, uh, the growth of energy consumption? This is mainly the population and the technology. Whenever you have new technologies, new businesses will be started, new industrial sector will be incepted, and also with the uh, rise of the population, you need more energy. And whenever you need energy, and there will be, you know, a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emission. So our target is not to increase the greenhouse gas emission, as you can see, uh, since 1991 to 2018, it's uh, continuously increasing the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, and if you see that, what are the major sectors for the greenhouse gas emissions? So the main sector is the energy sector, which represents 73%, 73%, almost two, uh, three third of the total part. And the other part is uh, agriculture, forestry, and land use, and other uh, sectors are waste and industrial processes. So now the global, uh, the globe or the world is uh, moving towards the net zero em emission by 2050. They would like to achieve net zero emission by 2050. So now to achieve this net zero emission by 2050, who are the main players? Who will be doing the task? Is it uh, only the reducing the consumption, or it is the energy efficiency, or is it the renewable? So let us see. As you can see, according to IEA, uh, their projection is the renewable will be responsible for 35%. And we have other sectors who will be helping us to achieve the net zero emission by 2050. Uh, one will be the behavior and av avoided demand. So we can avoid some of the demand which is not needed. Hydrogen will play a good role here. Technological performance, the performance of the technology will be increased. And electrification of various sectors, including the transportation sector, carbon capture, utilization and sequestration, and other sectors will be helping us to achieve the net zero emission. So now, if you see the global trend, already you have seen it. So uh, the wind and solar is like, they are competing each other. But if you go back to 2012, wind was almost three times higher than solar. But now, in early edition, you will see that the solar edition is three times higher than or four times higher than the wind edition. Why is that? This is simply because of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> 
because of the technological advancement or the cost reduction. As you can see from 2009 to 2019, the solar was in 2009 highest. It was taking like $359 per megawatt hour. So now it is less than like 40. Uh, whereas others are still uh, more expensive than solar per unit energy production. And also you can see here that okay, the solar uh, you know, penetration is high, but still uh, the major three sectors for the renewables, those who will help us in achieving the net zero emissions are uh, uh, hydropower, wind, and solar. And others have very small percentage. And so this is not the dark side. If we say that, okay, where are the major portion of the renewables have been installed? If you see the MENA region or the Middle Eastern region, we have a very less amount, as Dr. Shafiq Rahman was mentioning. In Saudi Arabia, we have around one gigawatt of installation capacity, while the world has more than 3,000 gigawatt of installation capacity. But uh, the Middle East is coming into the game. So they have a big plan uh, like China. So Saudi Arabia has a plan to have 50% uh, of renewables by uh, 2035 or 2030. So they are coming into the picture. And also Dubai, UAE, and other uh, countries around the region, they have big plan. So soon they will make it from 1.13% to a big percent, we hope. And they are really doing it. So the other dark side for the renewables is if you just have the renewables, it will not help you to reduce the greenhouse gas emission if there is a curtailment. So if your grid is not ready to take the power, whatever you have, then you cannot uh, actually do anything with uh, the renewables. So as you can see in Kaisu, California, independent system operator, and also in China, you see there is curtailment, huge amount of cur curtailment, which is in giga gigawatt hour, big amount. Why it happened? This happened be because of stability, and the protection issues of the grid. So we must have to tackle these issues while uh, we are integrating them. If whatever we would like to install, we cannot integrate them if the grid is not ready. So we must have to be prepare our grid accordingly. So what are the challenges? So first challenge is finding the optimal placement. You have to first look at what is the good location for you. You cannot put all the solar PV plant in one side, like western side of Saudi Arabia or eastern side of the Saudi Arabia or uh, central side. You have to find the locations based on the load demand and other uh, factors you have to take into consideration. And also the power electronic devices, what will help you to integrate the renewables into the grid. They will integrate them, and also at the same time, they will inject harmonics to the grid, which is not good for the grid. So we have to design some controllers so that we do not inject a lot of harmonics into the grid. Then intermittent nature. You know, the wind and solar, they are very intermittent. They are not like hydro. You have a dam, and you can control them. You don't have a lot of control over them, except doing the prediction. And high penetration of renewable will drive inertia requirement. So they are not, we call them in technical term, we call them non-dispatchable. Whenever you want, you cannot dispatch them, okay? You need five gigawatt, you cannot dispatch from renewables. You have to have some other alternatives. But if you have the traditional power systems, whenever you need, you can just increase the, uh, you know, generation or decrease the generation. But, we, but with renewables, you will have these problems. And then also PV and oil curtailment due to the protection and stability reasons, less accurate power prediction. We have to have a good uh, accurate power predictions and also the protection. So when you include the renewables into the grid, then you will have multiple directional power flow, not like the previously without uh, renewables. And then at the same time, my colleague, Dr. Amjad, he will be discussing the policies, skilled manpowers, and a lot of things are needed. So these are all challenges we have to overcome. And including these available challenges, many things are coming in the future grid. In the future grid, you will see that a lot of data are coming. A lot of internet of things will be there. We'll be installing. So there will be already installed 10 million smart meter. And uh, there will be, you know, energy storage systems and also the PV cleaning and a lot of issues will be coming with the renewables. 
And this is the structure of the grid. You will see that multiple directional uh, power flow and information communication is flowing from here and there. So there will be issue with cybersecurity, with control, with protection. A lot of things are there. You have to take decisions. So to deal with these challenges, what we need to do, we have to have a very accurate or improved forecasting system for intermittent renewable energy resources. We have to have demand side management, regional coordination, energy storage system can help us to uh, remove or uh, get rid of from the inertia issues, uh, intelligent solutions for smart and microgrid systems, power quality disturbances, rejections. We have to use the big data analytics and so on. Uh, good uh, uh, converters and appropriate regulations, grid code, and also for uh, renewable energy integration policies. So what we are doing at KFPM, so whatever I have explained to you, I'll finish, uh, Dr. Ramjad, within the next two, three minutes. Yes, yes sure, take it. Okay, I know that uh, we are running out of time. So what we are doing at KFPM to deal with these issues or the challenges what we see, I have seen. So as you can see that we have used a supercapacitor here along with the PV power system, which will help us. We develop the control strategy. Now the supercapacitor is not our inven uh, in uh, in invention. Our invention was the control strategy. We have developed an excellent control strategy to mitigate the fluctuation, what is coming from the PV, so that we can inject a constant power or we can play with the power injection into the grid. The next one is, at the same time, we are developing some power electronic converters, which is like sil silicon carbide-based power electronic converters, converter, which are the state of the art. So we reduce the you know, switching losses or their uh, efficiency, we increase the efficiency, and also they were doing in terms of temperature uh, and other issues. And this one, we are using same the energy storage devices with modular multi-level converter for high, uh, high voltage uh, direct current network. Here we have developed, as you can see, there's some adaptive protection scheme. And as uh, uh, the, this one is like smart grid fault diagnosis when you have renewables in the distribution side or in the microgrid, then the fault diagnosis will not be as easy as the previous or traditional system. So we develop some fault diagnosis schemes by utilizing signal processing technique and also machine learning techniques to tackle. And we achieved a good uh, number of accuracy. And now currently we are working with Ministry of Energy to have some prototype or to advance the technology from TRL level, lower TRL level to the higher TRL level. So this one for the power quality disturbances detection and classification. So we use some yeah, CNN model, which is uh, free from signal processing technique. So this one help, will help us to achieve uh, the, uh, you know, to identify the power quality issues. And here, Dr. Asif with us, so we are working here to not only to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, but also, you know, in power system, we have a lot of devices like uh, uh, interrupter, air interrupter, or the SF6-based interrupter, which will, there will be some leakage of uh, SF6 gases, which is very d uh, dangerous to the environment, and also this is a very serious uh, greenhouse gas. So we are working in this area to, you know, remove this SF6-based uh, uh, interrupter with air-based interrupter, so there will be no leakage from uh, those interrupter and we will be uh, over, overcoming with the challenges for greenhouse gas emission into the atmosphere. And also we are working with uh, electric vehicles, a lot of things are there. So due to time issues, I will just uh, quickly go over. We have a lot of resources in the university we are doing. We have the state-of-the-art facilities in the department. We have whatever we want, we can do that simulation. And we did some kind of you know, an, uh, benchmarking with the top class uh, laboratories worldwide. And we have seen that we are very much competitive with them. So our uh, resources, whatever we have, our facilities, our faculty members, we are compatible with the world best resources available. And these are some of the projects we did, and we have a lot of, you know, the stakeholders with whom we are doing the uh, projects to tackle with the grid integration issues. So that's all from my side. Due to time issues, I just need to pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Amjad. Thank you, Dr. Shafila, uh, for being on time. And uh, now my part, policies and the regulation and the environmental impact. Uh, basically, I am known as an against to renewable energy. 
but I am not against the renewable energy, but I am always worried about the future of the renewable energy, its impact. So far, we are seeing the one side of the picture, but there are very few people in the world who are worried about the second side of the picture. Since we are uh, here in the education department or doing the research, we are seeing that it's a green, 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 green. Is it really a green? All the books in the world, all the researchers in the world, they are saying it's a green. It's a CO2 reduction. It, uh, uh, environmental protection. Let's see the second part of the picture. As uh, my colleague Dr. Shafiullah explained that uh, so far, the growth of the solar photovoltaic is exponentially increasing. Uh, if we see from 2012 to 2021, from 101 gigawatt to 843 gigawatt. And still, the many countries like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has a vision 2030, China has a vision 2030, America has a vision 2050, European Union has a vision 2060, means we all are just running, 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 and running for the installation of the renewable energy. Installation, production, installation, utilization, whatever we can do, we are doing. So this is the projection by 2030 and 2050. We can see from 2010 to 2030, by 2021, it is 843 gigawatt. And by 2023, uh, 2030, sorry, it will be 3, 000, uh, 1,630 gigawatt, which is a 3,940% increase from 2010. And by 2050, it will be 4,500 gigawatt of the solar photovoltaic installation in the world, and total it would be a, an average 11,055.79% increase from 2010 to 2050, within 40 years, 11,000 time increase. We are just going to install it, install it, install it, whether it's a, a large-scale solar power plants, it's a rooftop solar power plants, it's a, uh, electric vehicles, or whatever so we are doing, even now we are planning to uh, PV aeroplanes, photovoltaic aeroplanes are in the uh, trial basis. We are doing it. Let's see the second side of the picture. By 2030, round about, in early scenario, 8 million metric ton of the solar PV wastage will be generated. 8 million metric ton. And by 2050, as we all know, that uh, solar photovoltaic has the life of 20 to 25 years. So the panels which are going to be installed by today or tomorrow, by 2030, uh, by uh, today's 23, so by 2050, their 25, 26 year of age will be, they are, they are at, at the end of their age. They are useless for us. What we can do then? Look at the 78 million metric ton of the wastage will be generated there. 78 million metric ton. As we all know that the plastic shopping bags, they have a life, if we will not, uh, process it according to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency rules or the UN SDG uh, guidelines or some other uh, standards, it has a more than 1,000 year of life. Plastic shopping bag, which we are used to do every day, uh, carry in our hands. The same way, the solar photovoltaic, it has a 700 plus year life. By 2050, if we will throw these PV modules in the desert, there are a different material, the silicon, copper, silver, EVA, ethylene valine acetate, and glass. Five different materials are there, and every material has their environmental impact. Every material has their environmental impact. So this is the right time before to reach the end of life by 2050, if we will not talk it today, we are destroying the world, universe. What the UN, SDG, and the EPA or other uh, multinational organizations are looking for. So this is why I am not in the against of the renewable energy, but I am worried about the future of our universe. This is how we will throw these PV modules after 20 or 25 years in the desert, maybe in the kingdom, or uh, maybe in other countries, the leading countries in the world. Sorry, don't take my words in a wrong way the so-called developed countries, the developed or the civilized nations, they are the leading in the world, 
चाइना अमेरिका कैनेडा ऑस्ट्रेलिया जर्मनी इंडिया इज इन द कॉम्पिटिशन नाउ ऑल्सो सो दे आर द मोर प्रोड्यूसर एंड इंस्टॉलर ऑफ द सोलर पी वी सिस्टम एंड दे विल बी द मोर बेस्ट जनरेटर इन द कंट्री दीज आर द टॉप फाइव कंट्री इन द वर्ल्ड हु विल प्रोड्यूस द सोलर पी वी वेस्ट बाई ट्वेंटी थर्टी एंड ट्वेंटी फिफ्टी जर्मनी इंडिया जापान यू एस एंड चाइना and look at the china an early stage of 20 million metric ton the us 10 million metric ton these are the top 5 if we will see the other ranking definitely other countries are there do we have the right policies and the procedures to recycle it are we worried about the recycling of the because it has a poisonous the silicon material now we are in the third and the fourth generation of the solar pv manufacturing uh, technology like the thin film solar cell copper indium gallium sulfide cigs and they have more environmental and health issue if we will not recycle them accordingly then we are trying to do two parallel thing we are going to waste our uh, resources and the second we are going to pollute our environment and the third we are going to give a bad environmental condition to of the future generation as dr shafiq rahman sir explained as much as resources we will utilize there are some natural disasters overview of ks ks as we are sitting in the ks and ks mashallah it was so far the global overview and we all know that uh, kingdom has mashallah vision 2030 and 50 8.7 gigawatt of the renewable uh, uh, the electricity will be there so far what we are seeing that electricity generation and the graph uh, 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 and then demand by 2021 89.9 gigawatt of the generation was there and 64.16 uh, demand by change in the generation capacity i will just uh, talk the last uh, side of this. you can see by 2019 2021 the increase in the demand means kingdom electricity demand is increasing day by day year by year and this is why kingdom is very much focused on the renewable energy to reduce the dependency on the fossil fuel and increase the share of the renewable energy today we are talking about but again i will raise the question after 20 year where we will stand do we have some policies and the regulation to recycle it these are some of the major projects in the throughout the kingdom Uh, map uh, and these are the information taking from ministry of energy and repdo and uh, other organizations these are the large scale projects uh, some of uh, on the ground some are in the pipeline and some are plan under planning so uh, i will not take much time uh, these are the projects uh, around the kingdom so in rough arithmetic just just basic mathematical multiplication and the division or something like this one kingdom by itself if they are going to reach the 2030 target uh, after 2045 they will have a 2.9 million metric ton of the wastage of the solar pv module we are we have a ambitious target of 50% of the renewable energy by 2030 okay let's see be realistic if we achieve this target and the by 2030 to 2050 we have a 20 years life of the pv module and by 2050 how much solar pv wastage will be there 2.9 million metric ton this is a, just a basic uh, arithmetic uh, divided and multiplied with something like this one if we will uh, do th- some technical parameter metha- uh, calculation then it might be a more so solar pv end of life policies and uh, policies overview yes policies action is needed to address the challenges ahead definitely we need if we will not look now it's a time tickling bum the days goes on the problem coming on our head so let's open our eyes and save the future save the world save the universe the policy without policy we cannot do do we have the policies let's see these are the uh, some of the countries like the i have previous slide the china us japan india and germany top 5 leading solar pv module west generation countries uh, unfortunately i will say none of the countries have a direct solar pv module west recycling policy indirectly under uh, electronic waste under uh, other wastage they have 
but what i am focusing for that we are making the policy for all the positive things that let's see the grid integration policy feed in tariff and power purchasing capacity ppas we have a very good policies for this one according to the renewable energy concept but we don't have the specific policy to the pinpoint that how to recycle solar pv module if we will not recycle it then how to manage it so these are the top five countries in the world and i will say they have but not the specific so saudi arabia in 2021 they have a west management law specific especially is still the west management it's a very generalized broad spectrum policy for the west management and they have something over there for the electronic west management i will be happy if somebody is sitting here from ministry of energy environment vera ekra that let's come to the point hit that point where we can manage it and these are the some of the uh, articles in the case uh, like article number 11 14 16 and 18 these are some of the articles in the kingdom west management law which are partially dealing with the environmental protection of the renewable energy but not specifically so these are some of the challenges solar pv industry west is a time tickling bong as i say the heavily subsidized solar industry will create million of the ton of the polluted sludge yes as dr shafula said in 2009 it was a 800 something dollar per megawatt hour now it's a 40 highly subsidized yes to promote the technology is a good thing but after promotion to leave it abandoned it it's not the good thing average solar pv life span is 20 to 25 year as i say but higher temperature accelerated in the region process yes the pv panel life in the uh, germany china canada australia uk us they have a 20 to 25 year but according to the kingdom of saudi arabia environmental harsh environmental condition its life would be as per my estimation 17 to maximum 18 year means don't think about the 2050 your target is a 2040 or 2045 kingdom's target should be the 2020 40 or uh, 2040 or 2045 don't sleep that when the 50 will come we will see it no. open the eyes and dust and other natural issues are there the suggestion yes uh, every researcher as a uh, research faculty we give some advice and the suggestion to everybody that if you can do something like this one you can manage something like this one so uh, i will just end it here and uh, we are open for uh, question answers thank you if anybody have any question you people can ask and we are here to give you any no question yeah there is a uh, couple of questions we have a two questions one so so i've got a question on this this last presentation uh, in terms of policy strategy do you think that the strategy should be on uh figuring out how to recycle or properly dispose of our solar panels that we're putting in right now or do you think that the policy strategy should focus more on the creation of solar panels that won't pollute in this manner yeah. uh, whenever we talk about the solar pv end of life waste management when we talk the waste management it is the circular economy the policy should be how to recycle it and during that recycling process the material we can extract like the silicon can be extracted glass aluminum copper can be and then the remaining wastage useless wastage how to dump it in a environmental protected way according to the environmental protection agency or the un sdgs and also the countries should have their own policies so the circular economy is there recycling material extraction and the useless waste dumping so it will be a good uh, way to uh, whole process waste management otherwise if you will just recycle it or you will not recycle it directly dump it to, to, into the desert or the dumping area i said it is the more than 700 year of life so this is why recycling is a very important 
And during recycling, there is a circular economy. Uh, all the things are in circular economy are hitting the job creation, uh, uh, revenue generation, or something like that. And, raw, and the dependency and on the natural resources, because the silicon will be extracted, and that silicon can all again be used in the uh, solar or electronic industry. So the dependency on the natural reserve will be saved. That's all. The, you, are, you are protecting the environment. So we have one question from the last row, the professor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bujmadi. I want just uh, give you an, uh, some observation, just a remark, because I am a 